Okay, so we'll, we'll kick off this uh, last session here before our lunch and our live music. Um, and I, I just want to introduce uh, Kelly for you because Alan uh, Tolifson is not able to make it. Um, and uh, he's, he's off uh, at other important meetings, but um, I wanted to, to at least thank Kelly for, for being here. She's our vice chancellor. Um, as it says there for our administrative unit on campus and a lot of people ask us how we're able to do so much at UC Davis um, in this energy world and um, really Kelly's the answer to that question. She's uh, very supportive of everything we're doing. She gets it in terms of our, our carbon goals um, and she's willing to uh, you know to support us when we're, we're we, we want to try something new and different. So um, she's going to be talking about that. This was Eric's, Eric Everhart's idea, actually, is to hear from Kelly herself on, uh, on how we were able to do some of the things that we've done and hopefully give you guys at other campuses um, some idea of what you can also try to do at your campuses. And I think there'll be a, a, a good uh, time here at the end of her talk for, for Q&A, so I'm sure we'll get some good questions for her as well. So with that, I want to turn it over to Kelly and, and really thank her for taking time to uh, present to us today. Thanks, Josh. Um, I'll, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. I'll, uh, I'll actually, do you want, do you want me to do the slides? Yeah, well, I'm prepared. Yeah, that's sorry, perfect. You can do it. All right, I, was, it up there. I think Ali had the intro up there. Great. Um, yeah, I'm going to give Josh a lot of the uh oh, there we go. A lot of the credit for um, how these things get done, not not me. It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell Josh no. Um, all right, so we've got a, a couple topics, and uh, the way my screen's set now, it looks like I can see a little bit of the chat and Q and A, but but we'll have time to go through a few slides and then um, do some engagement. I, I hear you guys have been having some really good discussion. So. Um, so here, let's just kick off with what are some of the common complaints and excuses um, that you hear from folks like me, um, that we don't have enough uh, funding for an energy team, that these things are way too expensive, um, and that you know doing something like electrifying an entire campus is impossible. Um, so you spend a little bit of time with, with Josh and a few folks here um, from, our, from our campus and you give it some thought, and you know some of the answers seem obvious, and we'll go into a little bit more detail here. Um, but of course, you can find money for an energy team. All these things are always a, a, a matter of priority, and so I want to walk you through some of the some of the case statements um, we used to do this. Um, and of course, um, not converting to hot water is even more expensive. Our our seam infrastructure at UC Davis is quite old. And, and really the, the key to, to getting this done has been having a really good master plan and trying to sort of tackle this um, one bit at a time. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the energy team piece, and then we'll do a little bit on our conversion um, from hot water to, uh, from steam to hot water. Oh, there you go. I just did my, my next slide. All right. So first, let's let's talk some about you know. So you want an energy team. Um, this this graphic here and and all these things are available, and I'm sure my colleagues can put the 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 links in the in the chat. But you know this this is just uh, an energy map at UC Davis, and something that Josh and the team were able to put together. You know that shows some of the relative scale of energy use and helps us identify the opportunities. Because in the end, this, this all becomes a sort of a cost benefit. We know we want to do it, we know we need to do it, um, but it's sometimes hard to get to that decision to actually spend the money until you can see some of the, see some of the data and the outputs. So really we started, we, we talk a lot about low hanging fruit. Um, and if you're a campus like ours, you actually have some because you have these old buildings um, and there's some simple things you can do. We did a lot of work up front metering and getting things on systems so that we would have the data. And then moving forward, um, we were able to identify and have delivered on a lot of savings. And so this, this chart, um, you know, Josh and his team put this together. So the sorts of things we did, we, we commissioned our lab buildings. You can save 25 to 100,000 per building. 
it's a it's a blend of of some one time savings and but it's mostly ongoing. Once you fix these things, you're in pretty good shape. Um, scheduling for HVAC that matters a lot. It's hard to do when you don't have things on common systems and standards. It's also hard to do if nobody's watching it. Um, and so having somebody on the team who's actually dedicating time on a regular basis to this helps you save, call it 100K a year. Holidays, um, you know, uh, we used to say it, it's not that much, but when you put it in this blend with everything else and you have the staff available to do it, it's much easier than trying to find folks to come in overtime or something else to sort of manage a holiday shutdown project. We now have a team who's responsible for this. And then, you know, our favorite uh, fixing the broken stuff. Uh, it turns out we all have a lot of broken stuff. And so this pie chart is trying to sort of identify some of this. And if you have a team of folks going into buildings, looking for things, you find the broken stuff. And for the most part, you know, our facilities teams just are so busy responding to broken stuff. We're not out there actively looking for it. And so when you do these things, you, you find things, you fix them. Um, and this is sort of the, the immediate sense of, of, of scale at a campus um, like ours. But um, there's going to be ongoing savings also just having the team, you know, stuff doesn't just break once, it keeps breaking. So we're out and about finding these sorts of savings all the time. So this, this is a scary, um, well, this is actually the good chart. The scary chart is the next one. But the gray, the gray bars here are, what did it look like for us to build an energy team? And so I'll, I'll, I'll show you the, the, who we have in our energy team. But, but the goal, the, the idea was, you know, we need about a million and a half a year. That's this gray bar. And so we sort of ramped up. We had a little bit of, you know, sort of turnover and calibration. These things happen. And along the way, we're building savings. And like I said, um, some of what we're, much of what we're doing is ongoing. So these savings, you know, build in and we keep growing the savings. Um, but we're also tracking on occasion one-time savings in the mix. But, you know, the, the proposition changes itself. And this is another way to look at that. So this is really, frankly, for somebody who's on the finance side, quite scary. You have to sort of, you know, grit your teeth and say, okay, I get it. We're going we're gonna to plummet here. And then we're going to start seeing some of the benefits. And you really have to believe you're going to be able to cross this line. And we're seeing some of that already. Um, we are sort of on, on the uptick here. We have full expectation that we're going to get to this place where we're not only paying for the team, but generating um, net additional savings. It's a 10 year plan, but my goodness, um, what we're up against here is way, way more than a, a, a 10 year plan. And if you don't start, you'll never get there. And if you wait till all, you have all the money in the bank, you're not going to get there. So this, this sort of projection and, and, you know, Josh brought a picture at the beginning, our budget folks spent some time poking around and digging at it. Um, it's, it's mattered and it's and it's let us again recover. This is sort of showing the cumulative expense. We will, I have full confidence, cross the line into the net generation category, which frankly will just help us, you know, offset probably some inflation and other costs, but but we will have done everything we needed to, both from carbon neutrality and from just you know taking care of the place. So this is the team. So um, we we can tell you a little bit more, Josh can tell you a little bit more about you know, why the scale of this team at UC Davis makes sense. But we wanted you to see both sort of the number of people and the type of people that we have in this team. And this is a, a separate dedicated team, self-funded. Um, so this isn't, you know, we're not tapping in. Our energy manager is, is, is funded on some other sources, but otherwise this was a sort of a net new proposition to add about eight folks to our UC Davis team and have them pay for themselves over this sort of 10 year planning horizon. Um, and it gives us opportunity also to have graduate and undergraduate students in the mix, which we really like. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the summary of the, this first case study about the energy team and how we got there. And then I wanna to talk to you a little bit about um, our big transition steam to hot water. Again, UC Davis, over 100 years old, I've got a little bit of a schematic in one of the slides about the campus. Aging infrastructure, leaky infrastructure, um, nothing about STEAM is helping us get to our carbon neutrality goals. And so what do you do? Well, the first thing you should do 
is work with your communication folks and come up with a really clever name. Um, uh, even something that almost could be a curse word is super fun for the folks involved. We have a great video on our big shift uh, website that was produced by students sort of trying to explain what was gonna happening. And um, we really promoted this and are promoting this as this is you know, a big shift in how we're energizing, how we're bringing energy to the campus and to our buildings, how we're achieving you know, carbon neutrality. These things matter increasingly. So it's not just a let's put new pipes in the ground and, and redo our infrastructure. It really is aligning the university's values with what happens to be an infrastructure project. And if you think an infrastructure project can't be cool, mm, you might be wrong. So we really behind the scenes, and this was something Josh did with a group of students from our uh, graduate school of management, and, and we had some consultant help. Um, we all know we should do it. And in this case, we actually did it. We actually looked at the life cycle cost over a 60 year time horizon. What does it take up front? What are the future capital costs? Um, how are we doing with operations, including carbon? Um, you know, not just a typical balance sheet approach, but we need to include everything. And we ended up looking at five alternatives. Um, I think our number crunchers probably had a hundred alternatives. And along the way we scaled to, you know, the 20 that we were sure we had to look at. And eventually we got to uh, five. And the, the five, actually here's, here's several of uh, the options that we looked at. And the, again, a 60 year net present value um, from, the, from the bookend that nobody wants to do, which is just renew the existing steam system. The, the scale here, hopefully you all can see this on your screen, but it's everything from the capital expenditures here in the, in the gray through to um, some of the carbon impacts from gas and electricity. And we ended up sort of zooming in on the recommended solutions here where we're doing um, a, central, uh, a central program with um, our air exchanger. So we'll, we'll look at this, but you know, sort of at the highest level, again, we looked, these are the dollar amounts. This is the scale for the entire campus. And then I mentioned that we're gonna sort of take this in pieces, but we did start with this sort of big master plan um, big effort, find the right approach. And then the next thing is, having decided this, how do you how do you break it into, oh, I'm thinking about my slides out of order. You all probably understand the benefits of hot water. But I, I think this slide is important as it relates to sort of, again, making the case to um, the CFOs or, or other folks who may be less familiar and really just see a big dollar amount like $350 million, you know, sort of, are you kidding me, to breaking it down into the, the different types of, of benefits that we're achieving and, um, and, and really what this is going to mean to the university. Frankly, this is partly the sort of messaging we're using as we explain why the campus is being turn up, torn up. And it's also important to explain why we're investing at the scale we're investing. All right. So we did start the big shift. Things are underway. Um, there are massive trenches and pipes. So I highly recommend um, you doing this at the beginning of a global pandemic, because it turns out nobody's on your campus. Oh, you probably missed that opportunity, but we were ready to go. Oh, and so this was one of our great benefits of the pandemic. Um, we invested a lot in this communication plan in this um, coming up with a branding of the big shift. We have signs ready to go, we have videos, and it turned out nobody was around to see them. And so we started digging really big trenches as fast as we could so that we could accomplish as much of the tearing up. This is the red line, is, is, our, is our phase one for the project. Um, I've conveniently forgot the amount, it's over $50 million, but this really is the heart of campus. Um, here is the, the quad right in the middle of the, the red area. And I'm, my pointer seems to not be, uh, there we go. This is, a, this is the quad, this is the main campus. This is our library, the main campus, our coffee house. Look at all these big, huge trenches. And it would have been a very different proposition. We would have been, um, there's my light sensors in my office going off. Um, we, we would have really been tearing up the campus and doing this project a segment at a time 
if it had been fully populated. Tearing something up, digging the trench, coming back, filling it in. We were really able to optimize on the construction um, because of that. And just yesterday, we had a conversation with the chancellor about what phase two looks like, where we would move now into this district, get another group of buildings on, and also our thermal energy storage is over here, add some uh, heat exchangers in our thermal energy storage area to further improve the efficiency. And by the time we've done this phase one and phase two, we will have spent about 40%, well, closer to 50% of the money and achieved about 40% of the savings. But, but we'll start seeing some of the, the net gain to this. So really the, the sort of the color coding gives you a sense of what it looks like to sort of run this thing in the, in the various phases. And um, we don't have a plan. We don't really know how we're gonna get to the subsequent phases, but success on phase one is getting us interest and some agreement about setting aside some funding for phase two. And I think it will, um, it will progress from there. So, you know, again, the, the, the things I've mentioned, um, we have to look at our existing 10 year capital plan. Um, folks in your shoes want to talk a lot about the avoided costs. Folks in my shoes say great, but there's not a pile of money sitting around to replace those steam pipes. So it's not like we're going to say, let's not spend the money on steam pipes. Let's do something smarter instead. The money's just not there. It, it should be, it wants to be, it's not. And so you really do have to think about the whole lifestyle cost and all the things that are going to happen, including operational savings. I, I also would encourage you to sort of be honest about the operational savings. Operational savings are most likely going to, again, help us forego some future cost increases. It's not going to fill somebody's bank account, um, but they're real and it's important. And in our case, we're planning to convert some of the operational savings into some of the debt repayment. We're doing tax exempt bond financing here. Uh, rates are quite favorable in our environments. And so you can repurpose some of the operational savings to pay some of those tax exempt bonds. It's not a one for one, um, but, it, but it, gets you, it gets you part of the way there. We wanna of course talk about carbon goals and then here's um, Josh's eBay uh, like plug. Um, Hand me downs may also help. So um, in about five years, this heat exchanger, our heat exchanger, is, is likely to need a new home. So I'll encourage you all to uh, bribe Josh uh, if you want to call, call dibs on a gently used heat exchanger about five years from now. So that's, that's what I had prepared as a formal presentation with a, with a lot of appreciation and, and thanks for Josh. And maybe we'll stop share and see what sort of questions we have or should, what should yeah, we do that, Josh? Yeah, Kelly, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, that was right on, and and I think hopefully this this addressed. I mean, this was one of our top three uh, topics from the last session. Is people want to hear how to do these type of projects? So, I'm hoping this answered some of those questions. Um, that heat exchanger you saw there, we actually got three of them from Stanford for for a really good price. So we we just want to pass along the love, uh, hopefully, and that'll uh, that'll motivate us to to get this get off of steam completely. Because once we are, we won't need those heat exchangers. Um, I, hopefully this, these headphones are helping my mic out, but, uh, we're yeah, sorry about mine. No, no problem. Um, I, I think everyone could hear you fine. So we're still looking for some questions. We got one that came in, um, Bruce at, at UC Berkeley is asking, are there opportunities where leadership people in your role, Kelly, uh, from different campuses get together and discuss the benefits of an energy team and hot water transition. And I know, Bruce has, has reached out to me at this level, and I'm wondering if that happens uh, at your level. You know, we, we do get together a lot and talk about uh, carbon neutrality, certainly in the University of, of California, where we have the, um, the initiative. Um, and I'm happy to advocate within UC for other curmudgeonly type CFOs like myself to get together and, and show people. We, we, we've been at this a while. So I think we should take the, the, the hard numbers. Um, part of what we've invested in is getting the data and find a way, Josh, to, to share this, both on, on my side with my peers and with your peers. So maybe we can figure out sort of how to get to a one, two page fact sheet about this self-funded energy team, you know, get it up on the webpage, get it up on our webpage and sort of share it with folks as a, 
as a, a literal best practice with the data to support it. Yeah, the Ali's calling that the big share. <laughs> A big show. We need a good name. No, I like that. I know Alan has done some of that with uh, the other uh, facilities leadership um, in terms of partners for performance and other um, groups like that. But I, I do think we can we can do more along those lines. And that's what this last set session that Eric was running actually was talking about is how to share some of these best practices. Maybe have whether it's forums, uh, you know, uh, sounding boards or or materials we can distribute, websites we can build. Um, I got a, a technical question that came in um, about whether we considered an ambient loop system with heat pumps in lieu of, of low temp hot water. Um, and I, I will say we did look at pretty much everything that could possibly be done as far as uh, how to do district energy on campus as part of that master plan. Um, and we had to work with existing systems and buildings. So we go into low temperature hot water, we actually had to test the buildings that were designed for 180 degrees Fahrenheit heating systems at much lower. We've been running them at 150 to 160 um, ahead of time just to make sure it's gonna work. Um, but, but that's as low as we're able to go with that. And then as far as putting heat pumps at all the buildings, we did look at that. That was one of those life cycle um, uh, analysis options. And with a campus of our size, it, it got to be too expensive in terms of maintenance and especially electrical infrastructure. Um, but we are doing that in a few locations and uh, we are, the, what Kelly was referring to in terms of heat recovery, we're doing it as a centralized system because we have that chill water system that's pulling heat out of the buildings. We're able to do centralized heat recovery. And that's probably the biggest reason uh, that we're going to this hot water system. Um, another question, that came in for you, Kelly, is what were some of the things that helped con convince the decision makers that the life cycle cost of your program was the way to go and be okay? And this is talking to think about maybe our, our uh, energy team and be okay with a 10 year, 10 plus year program before the savings is realized. So you're kind of going out on a limb with our team in terms of investment. Um, what helped convince you and the decision makers? You know, um, and I think uh, Sam's question is, is also related. Um, I, you get to put me in the in the category of believer, but I, it has to be the case um, that as we go through climate change and, and we have some of the issues that we've been having, that more and more of us need to be believers. And we really do have to look at these things on a, on a time scale. It is never gonna pay for itself right up front. And some of these things um, just need to be done. I will tell you our chancellor, in fact, our last two chancellors are, are, are both engineers. The, the data and the, the science piece of it matters. Um, we do these life cycle costs and they feel very theoretical. It's really hard to think about something over 60 years. Um, and so the truth is the 60 year thing is, is a bit of the, of course that's true. Um, but then you really have to dial it back and think about it, I think, in segments. Finding somebody who's going to sign up for 350 million, that's not going to happen. But our first phase is 50 million, our second phase is 70 million, and starting to project some of those increases. Or on the energy team, 10 years is both a long time and not really that long. But but there is um, there there is a, a, a bit of believing that's needed. Maybe there's a way to to do a little bit of an initial assessment. <clears throat> we had done some of the building commissioning work early on and picked something big like our library. So we knew some of what the opportunity was and we had some data points that we could, that we could leverage to say, um, this isn't just a pretty graph. We really think this is gonna work and here's why. Um, but there's, there's definitely a risk involved and, um, and that just requires some convincing. Kelly, I've got a, a question from uh, Ben Finkler in a chat that was an interesting one for you, but he says, as a public university, uh, how does the formula that the state uses to write, provide funding for the UC campus impact the procurement process? And he's talking about either hindering or helping, um, in particular, exchanging operating expenses for cap capital expenses. And wondering if that formula needs to change to make it easier to make the right long-term investments. Well, that, that would be a great question, Ben, except for the amount of money we get from the state to operate our buildings these days is zero. Um, so we have a certain amount of funding that keeps shrinking from the state, but frankly, our ability to do this is, the state has a lot to say with how we do our capital projects. 
um, what we do with our labor agreements, uh, how we do contracting out. Um, but there just isn't money flowing to the campus for operations and maintenance. So it's really up to us. Um, I think for the most part, our ability to borrow the, the modest amount of UC Davis has an over $5 billion budget and about 9% of it comes from the state. We don't, we don't have an opportunity to use those, um, those limited state dollars for this. Sure, I said, we're gonna redirect some of the operating expense, but there's enough other money around. Again, you should be able to work with your CFO to figure out how to get the savings in one color of money and, and how to pay for the debt um, with a different color of money. Th those are the sorts of things that need to happen. Great, great answer. Um, one question from Nishant was, it was a good one. Um, and he's asking if there's a way to get a, a cost per mile for a steam to hot water conversion. And that's actually one of the reasons we wanted to do this piece by piece is we, we did a lot of estimates, but um, because this is, you know, it's, it's unique to each campus and there, it depends on the piping system. We really didn't know exactly what, what it was going to cost. And it depends on the, of course, the market and the bids and all that. So we doing this first district, we're going to have a really good number for that that we can then apply to future um, projects, which is going to help us get approval for those as well. But that's the kind of thing we can also share with other campuses in, in, in whatever forum we can come up with. Um, we got a question about if your university leadership does not believe, how do you convince them that investment in energy team and energy projects is worthwhile? I, I think, again, um... Maybe you, maybe you develop some of the belief with as much data as possible. And so if you're not able to get some of the data from your own campus, maybe you're gonna go look and we're gonna share as much information as we can from, from UC Davis. So you can show again, as a, as a case study, here's, here's what happened, here's the age of their buildings. Look, they're similar to the age of our buildings. Um, other, other things where again, you might be able to package, package some of the data. Maybe you're gonna go do a pilot on a large building that everyone's aware of and just figure out how to squeeze something out of your existing team to get that one data point. There's always a danger there with, a, with, with leadership who doesn't believe thinking, well, you did one building, keep, keep doing it, keep doing all the other buildings. Um, and again, not understanding that you really have to have the dedicated, not just the staff, but staff of a particular type to get this done. And so maybe again, us sharing and, and being very transparent about what we're doing, what we're spending, what we're finding could help. And, after that, um, you know, have them listen to some podcasts about climate change. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that is one of the reasons we want to share some of these numbers and success stories is, you know, just for example, the fact that, that you can go fix broken stuff in your HVAC controls, mostly without even setting foot in the buildings, just, just the programming, um, you know, turning off overrides and things like that, uh, and save two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, that pays for, you know, a couple engineers. So, you know, this, this is something that anybody can do and, and you just have to get those real numbers in front of the right people, I think, to, to at least let them uh, give you a chance. Um, question from, from Bruce, a good one about where in energy efficiency improvements to old buildings um, folded into the big shift program. And that, that's, a, that's a tough one. I think it, it was expensive enough as it was. Um, we, we really didn't, and, and it's sometimes hard to get a number on exactly what is gonna need to be done in the building. So we did have to draw a pretty uh, bold line around the big shift pro program and, and limit it to mechanical room you know, conversions where we're tying into the building systems. In a couple of cases, we know there's things we have to do in buildings to make them work, um, but mostly we're trying to take care of those either ahead of time or, um, for example, as we're hooking up to buildings and, and finding problems with Delta T uh, in, the, in the building systems, we're, we're addressing those in terms of our energy team is, is getting involved in helping with that. Um, we have a little bit of a, of a cushion because we aren't off of steam yet, and so we, we uh, you know have some flexibility in terms of temperatures and, and uh, what kind of performance we have. But uh, once we have those heat recovery chillers in, in the next project, as Kelly mentioned, that's going to um, make, make it a lot harder in terms of we, we're going to need the buildings to perform. So um, I think it's something you need to think about, but it wasn't something we could just throw into the project and, and add a, a large cost to. I will say, Josh, the other thing that's happening in parallel, along with the um, energy team, the big shift, we do, we, we all have so much deferred maintenance. And in California, there's been some somewhat larger allocations the last couple of years. Those of you at, 
at University of California, we've been leveraging a lot the the iCamp systems, and we are trying to find ways to to make some modest improvements. At UC Davis, we're also doing um, some work where we've internally financed um, some of this deferred maintenance um, and some of this big infrastructure work. And so an internal finance mechanism works something like this. We look out about 30 years and um, take, call it $10 million today, put it in a fund functioning as an endowment, invest it in the university's general endowment pool and have a projection of, you know, that 10 million will grow to uh, 70 million, 50 million, whatever the, the right rate of return and so forth is. So let's say we, we plan on that 10 growing to 50 in 30 years, we're gonna spend 50 million today. And we're sort of self-financing. We're spending the money today, sort of creating a deficit on the operating side. Um, that costs us some negative interest, but along the way for the future generation, 30 years from now, um, my you know, successor successor will find a fund functioning endowment that's matured at the end of the life cycle and is available to um, pay off the 50 million we spent. So we're doing some of this self-finance deferred maintenance. And so that's one more bit that we're factoring into this. We don't have it all solved by a long shot, but, um, but we've had to use every tool available because the place is old and the carbon neutrality stuff has to be addressed. Yeah, that's a really great point. In fact, some of the buildings that we're tying into with this project on the big shift uh, had issues that were so big, we didn't want to pick them up with the big shift and those got folded into these deferred maintenance projects. Um, and, and so, and then we're, you know, th those projects are, are really coordinating with, with the facilities teams to work on picking up all mechanical scope and everything else that we can in those projects. So that's a real help. Um, so a question about how we had to revise any of our original cooling demand assumptions due to climate change. Um, that's certainly something that we've um, been looking at a lot. And, and you know the, the climate data that is, has historically been used for a lot of the projections is based on you know, 25 years of historic data, which doesn't always apply to uh, current or the future. So mostly what, the way we, we address that was just using sensitivity. Uh, analysis and looking at, you know, if, if things change by this much, how much is it going to impact our systems? Um, for the most part, uh, you know, our, our future loads were, were, um, were offsetting. I mean, with a, our carbon neutrality goal, it's sort of necessary to offset future loads with efficiency projects. And so, um, you know, both buildings being built in a much more efficient way or even a carbon neutral way and then um, existing efficiency projects that can offset growth. So um, that's a, that's the other way we address that is is you know demand overall going down as we as we move forward. Um, and then there's a question about cost of carbon credits used in future cost justifications. And again, that's something that it's hard to put a, a number on. Um, it, there, there is a carbon market, obviously, um, but future numbers are, are can you know vary widely. And so we address that also with sensitivity analysis, um, predicting the rank, full range of what that might be in the future. And that actually, you know, is it, it was a key part of the, the analysis for the life cycle costs. Um, and it didn't actually impact the choices we made significantly because um, whether it's you know fifteen dollars or fifty dollars, um, it, it really didn't change the ultimate decision um, that it was the right choice to go to to hot water and use heat recovery, things like that. Um, can you comment on the benefits of building the in-house team to do the building commissioning work versus having a third party provide the service and take a portion of the payback? Well, I think that kind of uh, answers itself in one sense. Uh, I think this is the way. Our, at least our campus tends to take the approach is if someone else would do this and, and make a profit off, off of it, it's probably worth us doing ourselves um, and, and paying for. So I think that's one part of it is that, that it makes sense financially for us to do it, but I think it also made sense. I mean, our, our original approach was hiring consultants, but one of the big losses there is, is just the loss of, of knowledge. Um, you, you know, they do a project and you might get a binder or a report, but um, you don't have any in-house, you know, knowledge gained from that project. The other real big advantage I've, I've found with our team is just that um, getting into the buildings at the level that we do, working through, you know, room by room with, with the uh, different 
uh, researchers in the in the space is, is something that consultants have, can have a hard time doing at that level. And so the, the consultants we've had success working with are ones that can partner with us, bring some added value expertise, but work with our team and um, and leverage our ability to, to work with the campus uh, community really closely. Um, is more cooling or heating storage part of the big shift to heat recovery chillers? Yes, definitely. Um, we mentioned heat recovery with our chill water system. And I think that is, is really key is we're gonna be able to, to get about 40 to 50% of our annual heating load from heat recovered from our cooling system. So we're, we're collecting this heat from the buildings to cool them off because we're able to then store that we're gonna, we're gonna run that through the heat recovery chillers, make hot water that we can store. And in our climate, we have a really significant uh, diurnal cycle in terms of temperature. So we're able to, for example, do heating at night and cooling during the day, uh, pretty much year round. And that enables us to you know, store our, our heat during the day as we're doing the cooling and then use it at night. Um, and so we're, we're adding, we already have a thermal energy storage uh, cooling side tank and we're going to be adding a thermal energy storage tank for the hot water as well when we add the heat recovery chillers. Um, so that's really a crucial part of it. Um, let's see, I think that is all the answers or questions I'm seeing. We've got a few more minutes. So if anyone has more questions, please uh, throw them in there. question might be, can we start lunch early? Yeah. <laughs> and the answer is yes, uh, we can do that. But uh, I, I do want to thank you, Kelly. That's really great to have you come in. It's, you know, it's not the same when, when uh, me or even Alan talks about it and says what you would have said. It's a lot better hearing it from you yourself. So we really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Thanks for including me. <laughs>